is wrong, right. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Eddie and Ben to the stage. Thank you for being here, guys. Um, we'll take all your questions in a moment. I do have a serious question first. What is your fitness regimen these days? How, how do you stay fit? I want to know. Just uh, don't do anything. <laughs> Be yourself. No, I, had, I haven't really been as active as I was before, just because I'm lazy. <laughs> lazy meaning I spend almost my time working. <laughs> so I don't set up time to do it, but on my free times, so when I do do it, I start um, practicing Tai Chi. Uh, I learned Tai Chi from uh, my Master, who she is 78 now, and she's based in Chinatown right here by Portsmouth Square. Uh, so I don't know if she takes any more students, but <laughs> she's, she's there. Is that a question for me too? If you want. <laughs> sure. Well, I have a, a puppy, so it keeps me in shape because I have to walk, walk the dog, and I have two young kids, so yeah. that doesn't. Take me. Um. Could you both talk about how you met and how, kind of a brief history of, of how the project got off the ground? All right, sure. So this film was uh, released in 2016 and I started filming, first, first filming in 20, 2010, 2011. But I had known Eddie for a while before then. So I first heard about Eddie and his case and his campaign when he was still in, in state prison in the early 2000s. I was a college student at UC Davis studying Asian American studies and learning about some of these really uh, uh, important issues of mass incarceration and deportation issues. and so. Uh, we had gotten connected actually through our um, mutual uh, mentor and, and hero, um, Yuri Kochiyama, which is why we dedicated the film to her. Uh, so Yuri was part of a, a small uh, group at the time, which later became known as the Asian Prisoner Support Committee, that really uh, supported Eddie uh, when he was in solitary confinement, advocating for Asian American studies at San Quentin. So that's. I read about his case, read about his struggle, uh, and then started writing to him. Um, and we eventually, uh, I, I visited him at Solano State Prison, which is near, uh, it's in Vacaville, California. And we started a, uh, pro a, a program, a visiting program, where UC Davis students would visit and meet and, and uh, provide uh, some space for, um, uh, socialization and support with uh, incarcerated individuals, including Eddie, some of his friends. And so this was kind of uh, the early stages of, of how I got to know Eddie and get involved. And some of the people that we met with, um, you know, hadn't had a visit from anyone in over 10 years. And so it just spoke to the level of isolation from community that we were trying to address and through through Eddie and, and many others, uh, that was kind of one of the goals of the Asian Prisoner Support Committee, which was to kind of bridge that divide between incarcerated community members and, and folks from the outside. So I was just so inspired by Eddie and meeting him and working with him, and then later uh, in my own kind of trajectory, wanting to do uh, some work in film and documentary, then uh, fi finding that opportunity years later. Anybody have any questions they'd like to ask? And this is your first film? So it's uh, not my first film, but it might be my last. <laughs> it, was, it was a lot of work. Uh, it's, I, it's just so much respect to the full-time artists and filmmakers out there. It's you know, such an uh, investment of time and uh, you know, mental and spiritual energy. So it took, you know, this film took uh, five, six years, you know, just to make it, you know, not, not including, you know, trying to get it out and show it to the world. 
Um, I, I made a couple other, you know, very small budget documentary films. This Breathing was the uh, first film that was broadcast on television, on PBS, so it, it's the kind of my, the film that I've, um, uh, the biggest project, the biggest production, and maybe I'll get back into it, but I made some short films and other documentaries and, you know, dabble here and there, but um, this was my, maybe my, my uh, <laughs> I've been taking a break. From. <laughs> no, it's very, very good. Thank you. Are you available for hire as a filmmaker if anybody would like your services? I'm still uh, retired from <laughs> filmmaking right now, but both Eddie and I, um, I think we can maybe just mention that we are, we are still working in the community in different ways, and so uh, the past year or so, I've been working at an organization in Oakland called Asian Health Services to uh, provide support and services for survivors of hate and violence. Um, and so there's been some, a, a lot of the, the, the skill set um, that I'm trying to you know, implement now is really gained from you know, some of what you can see in the film and, and working with Eddie as well as the Asian Prisoner Support Committee. And, Eddie's doing a lot around these issues um, and kind of continuing what you've seen in the film to today, you know, five years later, so Eddie can speak to that too. Well, happy New Breath, everyone. Thank you for being here this evening uh, just to watch this film. We haven't really had a film screening for a while because of the pandemic and then, uh, other work that we've been doing. And so I'm really grateful for Ben you know, not only as a friend, but then as someone that who really has a compassion and commitment uh, to social justice, right? So uh, Ben and I, you know, met each other, you know, in 2002, like really built that relation, uh, relationship uh, to, uh, he, he is not only a, a friend, but he's, you know, I consider him as a family member, like a mentor in many ways, because um, everything that we, uh, we have done together, you know, it's a partnership. You know? And so, without Ben in my life, uh, my party, there are many things I could have been able to accomplish. So right now, I'm the president and founder of the New Red Foundation. And the reason I started the New Red Foundation is because when we were allocating for resources uh, within the philanthropic spaces, as well as in city and county, it's always a challenge because of the modern minority men. People just think that Asian Americans or Pacific Islanders and like Hawaii, we, especially Asian Americans, we don't go to prison, right? The prison is not impacting us. Mental health does not impact us. Uh, poverty does not impact us. And so therefore, we have a very uh, a scarcity of resources to support the people uh, most vulnerable, especially the immigrant populations, the refugees. And so therefore, um, you know, I, I kind of, you know, joking to say that one day when I get famous and rich, I want to start my own foundation right, and give money away to support Asian Americans and Islanders. And so I didn't get rich. <laughs> uh, I was a little infamous. So I was able to use that as a way to uh, leverage uh, some of the trustful relationship that I was built. I was able to build uh, within the philanthropy and then also with other people in the community. So we started the New Bread Foundation, really addressed the inequity of the distribution of resources in the national philanthropy, which is uh, based on uh, reports and data as well, uh, gathered together by uh, APIP, which is an acronym for Asian American Responding Philanthropy. It really states that uh, pretty much 20 cents out of $100 uh, goes to support Asian American Responding uh, issues uh, in this country. And so out of that 20 cents, I was just wondering how many pennies actually go to issues around impact of incarceration, deportation, and violence right, in, in our NHPI community. And so, therefore, we're able to start the New Breath Foundation to really offer hope and healing uh, to, to people, you know, so they can have new beginnings, and uh, so we can use a kind of like a holistic way of uh, addressing trauma and harm so we can create a more authentic personal and public safety, right, instead of just focusing on uh, punishment and throwing people's lives away uh, 
because of the mistake that, that they made or the trauma that they have uh, inflicted in society as hurt people. And so then uh, we, we were co-directors of Asian Prison Support Committee, which is one of the only grassroots organizations when we first started out in the country that we really uh, want to raise awareness about the detrimental impact of how mass incarceration is impacting you know, our communities. And so I think, um, you know, as far as violence prevention work and youth empowerment work, that's something that I always um, wanted to do once I was able to become a critical thinker when I was incarcerated. So therefore, when I came out of the system after spending 21 years inside, uh, the first job that I was offered and uh, I took uh, is working for a community youth center of San Francisco, uh, CYC, in here. And so I was able to do a, a lot of work around the city and really try to not only focus on uh, helping uh, Asian American and Islander communities, but really trying to uh, build racial solidarity through uh, different multicultural youth leadership programs, as well as a political education in the form of storytelling, right, how to engage other communities. And so that has been uh, always uh, my value, you know, when I was uh, incarcerated as well as post-incarceration uh, to what we're doing today. Because we can't just focus on addressing symptoms and not really focus on the root cause right, of violence. And so therefore, I think, uh, you know, as we have seen on the, in the film, you know, how I was able to really come to terms where I took responsibility for my action, you know, as a young person that who pretty much lacks self-esteem and self-confidence has um, no idea of my actions can create such a negative impact, you know, and, and not, it's like kind of minimizing uh, the suffering, not only with my direct victims, but then really not appreciating the freedom and sacrifices that, that my parents and grandparents made so I can have a better future. And so therefore, I feel that uh, in, the, in the work that Ben is doing right now, the supporting survivors of violence or victims of violence, it, and, and what I'm doing is trying to empower other organizations to creating resources and access for them, it is to prevent uh, you know, harm from happening in our community. And the way to do it is through this multicultural lens. Thank you. Eddie, I have one more question. How did you learn critical thinking while yeah. you were in prison? Yeah, so, so, so that's the... Uh, that's a great question because in the, when I first entered the system, I didn't, you know, I wasn't able to read or understand English much or speak. I mean, I can have your conversation with styles and, and, but then when I was able to learn how to read and write, I was really able to feel more uh, confident and competent in a way that I can learn. I am good at something, right? And so from there, I realized how important education uh, is even though my parents have always instilled that importance uh, to me, but I just never listened, mm -hmm. right? Because it was easier to gravitate towards, you know, other, uh, you know, ways of like delinquency and other ways of uh, not engaging in education. So when I was able to do that, I became very well read. And the, the way that I became well read was really um, because of the, the lack of access in the prison system, uh, I was pretty much able to learn more about African American history, Latinx history, and other people's history before I was really engaged in learning about Asian American history. And then, but when I was able to do that, it really gave me an advantage actually when, I, when I'm able to learn about other people's culture and history and start connecting to my own culture and history. Then uh, that's when I was able to come to terms with this, this, uh, this phrase that I always use, which is like, I was able to tap into my chi. And the chi that I'm talking about is not only the life force that is uh, sustaining our lives, you know, and our breath, but the chi that I'm talking about is culture, history, and identity, right? That's why when we went back into San Quentin State Prison and co-created with the prisoners inside the Roots Program, right, which is the acronym for Restoring Our Original True Selves, it's really trying to expose the people who are incarcerated uh, the idea of this chi, right? How do they learn about that they, they, their ancestor, where, where, where they came from, you know, what kind of contribution they have made in this world, and you know, what culture practices that they have that they are very prideful of, right? 
And then that's informing the value and the identity as an individual. And then when we're able to connect to each other to that chi, then we, the, the most important things that we're able to do is to humanize each other. Right? So that's how I receive my critical thinking through being well read uh, in, in those type of literatures, but then also in engaging conversation and dialogue with other people of color that who may have different type of education or different type of view, at least the basis of is trying to learn and listen and to be able to have those type of courageous conversations sometimes. And therefore, I think the, the part of the Asian American studies and ethnic studies is very important in creating that space for critical thinking. Just like in today, when many of the you know, mainstream, sometimes more like a conservative blocks of people that who try to make critical race theory as something that is harmful instead as a way to advance social justice and equity in the community. Because historically, we just, most of the time in the institution of learning, we just don't get those type of true history uh, about what is happening, right? And so therefore, there has to be alternative educations and different type of literature, at least for people to choose when they are engaging in this uh, learning process. Eddie, could you speak about um, some of the poets and literary writers that you connected with early on when you were starting to read more? In the film, you mentioned poetry and that you were starting to write poems of your own. Yeah, uh, I, I remember, um, you know, I read many poems, especially when I was growing up in China. There were poems by different people, Li Bai, Tu Pu, uh, all the different poets. And But then uh, in the U.S., when I, I wasn't really exposed to poetry when I was going to school the, the first three and a half years before I got in trouble. But it was when I was incarcerated, I started learning more about, you know, the, the, your normal, like, uh, classic poets, you know, uh, in, in the U.S. literature. And then later on, I was exposed to slam poetry, right? And so that I start, you know, start writing my own poetry in a way. Normally, it's very, uh, just a few lines and, and sometimes, you know, even haiku poems. And then just very little poems. Until I met, um, you know, some, uh, someone that who is called uh, Derek Gilbert. And he's, uh, so he's a poet, he's an African-American poet. And then um, I, I met a couple of my friends that who, who were just kind of bringing poetry. To look, and they asked me, it's like, Eddie, let's stop writing all this, uh, you know, just short poems. When are you gonna write a slam poem, right? So that's when I started writing longer poetries. And so those influences really from people in the community, the educators, that who were able to expose me uh, in how to write those type of the poetries. And you know, just uh, some of the uh, one of the uh, literary, literary influence uh, sometimes for me is really how to look at uh, how to be non-conforming. Right, in the way that we express ourselves through poetry. And so uh, I don't have a specific mentor per se, but then we're really trying to uh, learn from different uh, styles of poetry and then just trying to make it my own. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. I, I just have a comment. So um, I met Eddie, I don't even know, more than a decade ago maybe, and so I knew your story. But I didn't know it like this, so intimately. And it's a beautiful film, it's a beautiful documentary. It came out, I mean, I know there's strong maybe within last year, I couldn't make it. I'm really glad I made it. I'm glad you made this documentary. And it's just, it's so touching. And I just think it's also powerful that, you know, you made this one mistake when you were so young, and you definitely deserve forgiveness. And I know you worked really hard for that. And, um, you know, hurt people hurt people, and good people make mistakes. And, um, I, but I was so, it's so inspiring to see like how much that meant to you and how valuable that was. And you weren't dissuaded even though when you heard from the victim in the letters or whatever, you still knew that the right thing to do was to keep pursuing it. And in the end, whether they accept it or not, you're whole because you know you mean it. And we can all feel it. We all know how much you learned and changed and transformed. And you are an inspiration and changed so many people's lives from all your work. So, I'm really happy I made it tonight, and thank you for making this film. Thank you, Tammy. Appreciate it.
I don't know how many times we marched together on the streets, you know, just uh, just doing work together you know, in the community. On the topic of isolation, especially you know uh, this year, the past couple of years, do you both want to say anything of encouragement to anybody out there, young people, whatever their age is, um, you know? the topic of isolation or community building? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that the past couple years, especially under COVID, has been uh, very isolating for all of us. And, you know, the many different communities have experienced you know, increases in hate and violence and mental health traumas and, uh, you know, deaths due to COVID and you know, it's been, I think, important to just recognize everything that uh, people have been going through, um, and these these issues and the the types of isolation and trauma. It's it can be very messy and complicated, and sometimes I think, you know, elected officials or just you know people in like these sound bites, it can it can appear very narrow in terms of. Um, you know the issues of crime and violence that we see today that are still plaguing you know many of our communities but i think when you address it you we really need to get you know into the 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 raw the rawness and the, get into the messiness of it and not try to fit it into like this one box and really understand it more holistically from kind of a, a public health you know, approach to violence and understand how everything intersects and all of the different types of uh, factors that are leading to, you know, harm and trauma in our community. So it's, it's hard, you know, I think it's really hard work. Um, but it's, you know, with someone like Eddie to really be open about his own experiences, I think those are lessons that we can take to really understand, you know, what healing and prevention can look like. And so I think that's one thought on, on isolation. Yeah, the thing about isolation really is uh, during the pandemic, I think people uh, had a little bit more better understanding of how mental health plays a huge part uh, in relation to isolation, right? And that also demonstrates to us the power of uh, privileges, right? And so uh, when we experience isolation, uh, depends on race, class, gender, and sexuality, that all shows up in different ways. And so if we are speaking from a, a power of privilege, when I don't live in an SRO, like a single room occupancy unit in Chinatown, where a family of three or four are living in one room spaces with a shared bathroom and shared shower and kitchen, then you know I have no position to say what isolation looks like for them versus if I live in a half acre property then I can have plenty of room uh, just to, to be in isolation uh, with my family, right? And so even that, there is still a different type of level of impact on the mental health uh, challenges. So I think to this type of isolation, for me, my reflection it went back into when I was in solitary confinement for 11 months, then my only human contact that I mentioned is like when the police are handcuffing me, when their hand is touching my hand and holding my arms to take me to, to shower or take me to attorney visit, uh, that's my human contact. Then, you know, it gives me a different perspective when the pandemic hit. I'm like, okay, I can deal with this, right? Because I dealt with worse. And so I think, you know, for us, it's like when, when we understand this, we should have a better appreciation on how mutual aid is so important, right? How we can support each other do understand this type of isolation and mental health impacts and not trying to continue to further divide us. And we can kind of like uh, magnify that and look at the intersectionality about how scarcity mentality always show up in our people of color community, right? Whether why are they getting this and why are we not getting this? And how come they're getting this, we're not getting this, but nobody's really holding the system accountable saying that how come the system is not who, that is designed to support and help us, how come they're not being held accountable for creating those type of resources for everyone and not pit us against each other based on the color skin or social stratification right, in those type of spaces. I think those are the things that uh, allow me to really reflect on and see that 
we have so much work to do in um, cross-cultural engagement, in putting culturally competent resources so we can really come together to address anti-blackness, address anti-Asian violence in a way that is all impacting to all of us right, internationally, not just locally, but internationally. So I think uh, when it comes to isolation, we just have to uh, look within ourselves, right? look at what difference can we make uh, as we understand our personal isolation and the, the community isolation that, that we are a part of. Thank you. Um, question, yes? Yeah, so I just want to say thank you for the film. It, it really touched me. It was, it was very inspiring. And I guess I have a two-part question. One, one is which, in the parole hearing, I was furious at the first rejection that, that you showed. I'm sure there were more rejections, but that, that one really struck with me. So I was curious, what do you, like, is that a common thing? Is that something that, that the public should be trying to change? So that's kind of my first question. And then the second one being, uh, what can we do to help you? Because your efforts are inspiring. I'd love to, to see what I can, I can do for you. Give support. Thank you. Um, so, so the parole hearing process for live term prisoners, right? So that's the uh, uh, those were the people that who had indeterminate sentences, meaning that people that who has a certain amount of year plus a life top, then you have to go to the parole hearing to meet with the commissioners that who is part of the you know that works for the governor right, to determine whether a person is eligible for parole, meaning that whether that they want to determine the person is, is still a threat or not to society if released. And so the common practice has been um, anyone that who goes in front of the parole board, majority of the time, depends on the political climate, right, or the governor's political ambition, and how the public respond to criminal legal system or incarceration or punishment and public safety then it determines how they're gonna rule in when they go when people are going to parole hearing. There's always that eligibility for people at a certain amount of years that they're eligible to go in front of the parole board to be paroled. And so, but because uh, incarceration is such a profitable uh, institution with the prison industrial complex, the longer people stay in the prison system, the more money the state will get right from taxpayers. And then you know that secures jobs. That also secures political careers. And so, therefore, it's a common practice for people to get rejected when they go in front of the parole board. And even though at, at times, like in my situation, where in 1998 I was granted parole unanimously by three commissioners right, under Governor Prit Wilson at the time, and but then because every parole cases had to go in front of the governor to get approval even after the three commissioner has approved a grant of the parole. And so um, the, the, the process, in the process, it's, it's up to the governor to decide at the end whether they're gonna grant the parole to someone. And so in my situation, uh, they, they rejected to sign my parole. So when Governor Ray Davis came into the office, he had a no parole policy, meaning that he was expressing, once he took office, in the LA Times and in other media to say that the only uh, prisoner, the lifetime prisoner is gonna get out of prison under my watch is with toll tax on, right? So unless you die, that's the only way you're gonna get parole. Uh, so he has a very tough policy you know, around not getting parole, even though people are qualified by law and they still uh, make that you know, unilateral decision to do that. So uh, at the time when I received my parole, grant, it was easier for people to hit the lottery than getting a parole uh, grant. And I hit the lottery at the time, but then they rejected me. So that took me another six, seven years before I went back to the parole board and get uh, recommended for parole. So one of the interesting things that I asked the commissioner after they rejected me the following year, I went back to the parole board. Uh, even though I had more accomplishments, so at the end of the hearing, they just pretty much say, Eddie, uh, we apply you for all the accomplishments you did, but because of the seriousness of your crime, uh, you pose an unreasonable threat to society if released at this time. So I'm like, okay, commissioners, 
I want to ask you a question. He's like, okay. I said, last year, three commissioners unanimously approved my parole, saying that I'm no longer a threat to society. A year later, I come with more support, more letter recommendations, more job offers, and accomplish more. How did I all of a sudden become a threat to society? They have no question. I mean, they have no response to that because their boss is telling them, you're not going to give anyone parole grant, right? And so therefore, it became very political uh, in this whole parole process. And so we definitely need to change that parole process, and especially when it comes to, uh, that's why the, in California they passed the law, right, uh, in responding to the people that who were arrested or who had serious charges when they committed a crime uh, under 18 years old. And then also uh, under 21 years old, because we know that as transitional age youth, right, which is people that all the way up until the age of 25, they're considered transitional age youth. And as we learned from, uh, you know, the, the first uh, African American Surgeon General in the state of California, Dr. Nadine Bird, uh, who really focused on addressing the child uh, adverse childhood experiences and how that has impacted many of the young people when they are committing crimes and sometimes serious crimes, you know, how they're we still need to understand their, their brain development and how they uh, make those type of poor decisions you know, when, when they're in that development stages, and, but still holding them accountable, but with the perspective of helping them to grow, to rehabilitate, and so they don't uh, commit harm again. Right? And so that's why we need to, to change the parole system. And one of the things that we didn't talk about, and Ben has really fought very hard for when he, when he was outside was that uh, for people that who are not citizens of the United States, you know, after you're serving your, your time, you're automatically detained and, and deported, right? So we have a, someone that who you see at the end of the film, I hand the mic to this guy, his, his name is Pun, and so he was a, you know, a young person, a teenager when he had committed a crime. He spent 25 years, you know, on his life sentence. And then they unanimously granted him parole, and he was released by the governor. But then the ICE immediately took him into custody for deportation. And even though we have elected officials, we have community support, uh, faith-based community, and all want him to stay in this country because his family's here, his work is here, and all the things that he had done in incarcerated, um, they refused to give him a pardon or let him come back out of society. Instead straight after 25 years in state prison and then spent almost a year in uh, ICE custody, he was deported to Cambodia, which is a country that he's never set foot in, right? Because again, you know, when we look at this type of policies, it's not just domestic policies, it's U.S. foreign policies that we've seen a lot of proxy war that has happened in the name of democracy and capitalism, and that how we're destroying families in other people's countries. Right? And so those are the things that we need to uh, understand and to hold the uh, system accountable for those type of harms. Because when they perpetuate those harms, then it directly impacts our personal safety and public safety. But then in, in the norm, as we have experienced in the last couple of years with anti-Asian violence, people just only want to focus in on making sure that whoever they inflict the harm, they do not inflict the harm again. And the only way to do it is lock them up and put them away uh, as long as we can, right? So that's not that's that's where the uh, band-aid solution uh, comes in. So therefore, I think you know it's important for us to look at all the different aspects of not only the parole system but the criminal legal system that is really uh, set in place through the prison industrial complex that profit off of people, especially uh, the overrepresented uh, population, the Black and Brown Indigenous people, as well as the Asian American Native Hawaiian Pacific community. How you can help, uh, like I say, you know, I created the New Breath Foundation to really uh, be unapologetically focused on addressing the inequity of the distribution of resources uh, to organizations or to communities within the Asian American, Muslim, and Native Hawaiian community. And so you can definitely uh, to learn more about uh, what we do and then also try to, you know, uh, raise more awareness about some of these uh, challenges and needs. And then we always uh, welcome donations. And if you, if you yourself who is a multi, 
millionaire, billionaire. Uh, let me know, and if you have a friend that who is, let me know, and you know, they will. I will make sure that money goes into the right cause. What about you, man? Well, no, I just want to comment that I, I, I do think it's it's unfortunately not uncommon. You know, Eddie's experience with the pro board. I've they're public, so I've read you know the parole hearing transcripts of some of the clients and cases that we've supported. And there's one case, for example, where there was a lifetime prisoner who served about 20 years, uh, who grew up in a refugee camp in Southeast Asia. And as part of the hearing, they asked him about his childhood. So he was very open and honest talking about growing up and the challenges of growing up in a refugee camp after a war. And he described, they said, oh, how, well, how did you eat? He said, oh, well, sometimes we get food here. Sometimes we would go to a nearby farm and pick uh, vegetables or pick the food from the farm. He said, oh, was that your farm? He said, no, it wasn't my farm. Oh, so you were stealing. He said, oh, you've had a lifelong pattern of criminality. And that was actually one of the core reasons why they rejected him as suitable, because he hadn't addressed you know, his lifelong criminality. And so all of the commissioners, almost, they're all law enforcement, former prison guards, officials, you know, sheriffs, like all these like law enforcement backgrounds. So some people have tried to advocate, oh, this, this commission should have people from you know, mental health background, public health, violence prevention background. There needs to be more than just one perspective to evaluate if, if someone is, you know, quote unquote, safe to re-enter society after serving, you know, 20 years in prison and understanding childhood, you know, better than a law enforcement only perspective. So I don't know if that's gone anywhere, but, you know, I think like taking action to try to, you know, get that um, change would be a needed reform. On the kind of a positive side, though, there have been some changes due to Supreme Court decision and the overcrowding in California prisons. And so actually in some of the footage from this film, a lot of the people that you see in blue, a lot of the incarcerated people on screen have actually come home since then. And so they're, some of my coworkers and colleagues, they're you know, uh, working in mental health field, they're working in uh, community settings, they're working in tech, they're working in you know, thriving in all these areas. Um, so, so actually a lot of the people on screen have come home and a lot of them were life-term prisoners, you know, similar to Eddie. Got time probably for one more question. Uh, it was a great film, I really enjoyed it. I've been to San Quentin as a performer many years ago and I want to know where did you learn how to rap? <laughs> I mean, I, I don't really know how to rap, but then... Uh, <laughs> you rap very well. Yeah, but that's, the, that's actually uh, Bamboo, that who, one of the Filipino artists that who, who rapped that. But I did, you know, try to dabble in trying to learn how to rap, because when, when I was starting to confine them, there's not, not much to do. So all the other people on the side, they were just rapping. Rapping is just another form of poetry, right? And so I, I was trying to uh, figure out how I can uh, do something because other people was like, Eddie, what are you gonna do? You know, because they, they would make up something. And then I, I started making something stuff up too, right? So I said, well, just the other day, I was kicking with my homie in the pen next to the bay, doing all day, talking about justice, talking about peace, talking about the oppression that been on our knees. We drop our shanks and pick up our pens to write about the human suffering in the pen. What a difference a day makes, <laughs> 24 little hours, right? And so I'm just trying to like be a part of it to, to kill time, you know, to just have some type of interaction, you know, with people that I can't see because they're in a different cell. And so I think uh, that's why when we're talking about education, you know, we can't just only focus on the STEM, STEAM education, right? We need to add the arts component into the STEAM education and making this a a STEAM education, and not a STEM education only, right? And so that's where a lot of healing is coming from, is through people writing letters, writing poetry, writing essays, um, you know, just expressing themselves in different ways to find an outlet. And so we need to encourage that, and we need to do that not only with our children, but then also in the institution of learning. And that, I think there's another question right here. 
Somebody had a hand up? Yes. I know we're short on time, but Go ahead. I would love to hear more about um, the deportation defense work that you and you might be continuing to do. Um, and you know, I think your case really highlights just how dehumanizing the immigration courts are and also the deportation review process. So there's lots of mistakes and kind of careful administrative mistakes are made and then both you and Ben touched on some pieces where um, there's API immigrant populations that are coming, you know, to this country from uh, escaping from genocide and war and conflict, and you know, I, I think that population has been largely ignored. But it's also, you know, uh, those immigrants that are, you know, growing up in very um, impoverished kind of circumstances. And so I, I've seen all the kind of work that's been happening with the pardon applications and trying to, you know, appeal to the governor to try to set their deportation orders aside. But so much of that also feels like very case by case. And I'm wondering if you um, and New York have engaged in kind of um, policy and advocacy methods that are a little bit more systematic in terms of changing, you know, the way that people go through immigration courts. Um, and the fact that, you know, really is, it feels like every time these things happen, it's like people have to really justify themselves and, you know, kind of make a case about how their lives have turned around in order for them to be seen as deserving. and. Um, you know, have the case have a merit for them to be able to stay in this country. But how do we, you know, get to that uh, place where we can affect some systemic change in some of the immigration processes that we're seeing that are failing so many people? I'm going to say a little bit and then I'm going to pass the mic over to Ben and I'll have to go to a, a different event in a U U USF. Uh, I'm going to try there. I have you know, privileged to go uh, here with Dr. Clarence B. Jones, who is 92 years old, who is the speech writer for Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Um, we have a dream speech. And so in the questions for New Breath Foundation, we really just trying to cultivate resources and mobilize resources and to uh, give it to organizations who's doing the work in addressing those type of issues, right? However, we do have a, a program in a way that when, when we let a listening tour in Cambodia in 2019, we brought a lawyer with us and we brought the, some of the staff in the Asian Prison Support Committee to go over there. Children were really trying to listen to the needs of some of the people that were separated from their families and what kind of experience are they having uh, while they're separating from their children or their family from the state. And so one of the things that we learned uh, most impactful was that they need mental health support. And so we were able to uh, fund an organization in Oakland, California which is the Center for Empowering Refugees and Immigrants, Siri, uh, to be able to create this telehealth program called the New Light. So now they currently they have about 40 uh, people that they're engaging on the telehealth, right, with two staff, really trying to provide a, an outlet for them to share their personal trauma when, after they separate uh, from their family. As far as the immigration policy concern, and there's also different iteration of those type of policy that's, that's been happening, uh, but there's none that really trying to be uh, changing the dynamic of how, when we did harm on the international level as a country through our foreign policy, how do we amend those harms? How do we change those type of policies? And there's just no political will uh, when it, on the federal level, right, in that sense. And so one, one, one specific law that really created and expanded the impact of deportation uh, is the IRA IRA law that, that passed in, in 1992, right? Which IRA IRA stands for Illegal Immigration Reform and Immigrant Responsibility Act of 1992, which is 96 because it, 1996 because in 1995 that was the o Oklahoma City bombing by domestic terrorist Timothy McVeigh, right? And so when the bombing happened to kill many of the children and some of the folks in the building, the government scapegoated to the terrorists from the Middle East and other people. So Congress and, and you know, the executive branch that came together saying we need to push tougher immigration policy to prevent those type of terrorists coming in. But not understanding and addressing the exception of domestic terrorism that created those harm and not you know, other folks, right? But the momentum was able to carry them to pass this law, whereas, you know, as part of the clause was that anyone that who is not a citizen of the United States of America who have committed a crime or aggravated felony or crime of moral turpitude, they are automatically detained and deported, and the law is retroactive. So cases like petty death with a prior or domestic violence, possession of cells or substance, substance or drugs, um, 
that's considered crime of moral turpitude. Then that is open for deportation. You don't. You actually didn't have to go into prison or jail as long as you were sentenced over 365 days, right? And you're on probation. If you fit that category, you're automatically detained and deported. And it doesn't matter if you've been in the United States for 35 years or 40 years. If you're not a citizen, you're deportable. And so those are the things that's happening. But Ben can talk a little bit about some of the local effort and national effort on some of the campaigns to get ICE out of California, you know, to really try to support uh, the, the refugee and immigrant population. How do we make some, uh, some type of changes? So thank you very much uh, for. All right, give it up to Eddie. <laughs> You can look at my uh, internet and you can find me and I would love to connect and build How with all of you. you. He's on all the social media, Facebook, Twitter, oh, Instagram, okay. Eddie, yeah. Eddie Zhang, New Breath Foundation. Yes. And um, yeah, just as a final note, there has been a multi-year effort and campaign in California through the ICE Out of California Coalition and many a broad-based coalition to uh, the vision to to pass the Vision Act in California, which would have prevented the state prison to ICE transfers, which happen essentially automatic, and is up to the state. It's a the state and the governor are basically volunteering to collaborate and coordinate these transfers with ICE, which Eddie experienced and many of everyone who you know has that immigration hold, and so that would have been one effective way to prevent that kind of pipeline to deportation, but it has not passed, uh, unfortunately, the past couple of years. There's been uh, some political challenges. The governor, you know, has not been supportive, and uh, some of the key legislators, you know, it went to vote, but it didn't pass this last year. Uh, but there will be, you know, continued efforts around that. So I think that's one step on a state level, and then Eddie talked about federally, there needs to be change as well. Happy to talk um, with folks, you know, after. Thank you so much for coming. Just come to some final thoughts. Is tomorrow the open mic? Yes. So tomorrow, in the spirit of creativity and self-expression, we have an open mic here, and you can do poetry, music, rap, comedy. <laughs> Dance, you just get up here and do your thing. We have some more film screenings coming up uh, basically every Saturday through December 10th at the same time. And uh, we'd love to see you again. Thank you so much for coming out today. We appreciate having everybody here. Have a lovely evening. Thank you, Ben, for coming out.